Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the anatomy of the sternum, the rib cage, and the vertebra. So the sternum is shown right here. It's actually between both sets of ribs, and it's a relatively simple bone in structure. It actually has three parts. The top part shown right here, which is roughly square in shape, is called the manubrium. It's the most superior part of the sternum. Beneath the manubrium, extending down almost to the bottom, where this line is right here, this is the body of the sternum, or sometimes called the sternal body. All right? And then beneath that is this little extension down here called the xiphoid process. And really what the sternum does along with the ribs is its function is to protect the underlying organs. And you can imagine in this area, you're gonna have the heart and then the lungs are gonna flank the heart on either side. And really the ribs play more of a role in protecting the lungs. The sternum is mostly for protection of the heart, okay? That's pretty much all there is to the sternum. Now, for the ribs, what you'll notice here is there are 12 pairs of ribs. Now notice I said 12 pairs because for every rib that we have on the right side, which is this side numbered over here, we have another one on the left side, okay? And so that means we have 24 total ribs, but there are 12 pairs. And typically when we're referring to this, we really just discuss the pairs. Of the 12 pairs of ribs that we have, the first seven starting at the top, those pairs are referred to as vertebrosternal ribs. Now let's talk about why they're referred to as vertebrosternal. The sternal refers to the fact that they have each a direct connection to some part of the sternum. For example, if we look at this first rib right here, we see that its connection right here, although it's with cartilage, is directly to a part of the sternum. It just happens to be the manubrium. If we look at ribs two, three, four, and on downward to seven, we see that each of these has a direct connection to some part of the sternum. That's where the sternal part comes in. All 12 rib pairs actually have a connection to the vertebra. Let's actually skip to this next slide real quick and then we'll come back. This structure right here, this is actually a lateral view. Um, this right here is actually the sternum, okay? And we see right here that this particular rib, which is actually a vertebrosternal rib, has a connection right here to the sternum. It's a direct connection as we can see here. But then we see that the rib actually is going to articulate or connect with the vertebra as well. In fact, all 12 pairs of ribs, each one of them connects to the vertebra. It's just a question of whether or not they have a direct connection to the sternum. And if we look closely here, and we'll actually look more from a superior view, what we see is that the head of the rib, which we see right here, has a connection to the vertebra at a point on the vertebra called the superior costal facet. Okay, so this is where the head of each rib connects to the vertebra. And then if we look at each of these transverse processes, this one is the right one over here, it actually has a connection to the rib via the articular facet on the tubercle of the rib. Okay, so there's actually a couple connections here. One is with the rib and the transverse process, and the other is with the superior costal facet on the vertebra. But the point is, all of them actually connect with the vertebra, okay, in some way. And these vertebrosternal ribs not only connect to the vertebra, but they have a direct connection with some part of the sternum. And it does not matter if it's the manubrium or some part beneath, all right? Those are your first seven rib pairs. The next three, which are eight, nine, and 10, are called vertebrochondral. And let's think about why that is. And to understand this, let's look at the rib number seven, okay? This is one of the vertebrosternal ribs. And if we look at its connection, we're gonna follow the mouse, we see that it itself has a direct connection to the sternum, okay? With this piece of cartilage right here. However, if we look at ribs 8, 9, and 10, what we actually see is that their cartilage, instead of connecting directly to the sternum, it connects to another piece of cartilage, which happens to be the cartilage from rib 7. So instead of connecting directly to the sternum, they connect directly to a piece of cartilage. And you may have realized this by this point in the course, that chondro or chondra is the prefix meaning cartilage. 
So these are vertebral chondral ribs because we see that their connections are not to the sternum, but to a pre-existing piece of cartilage, which is actually part of rib seven. So that means eight, nine, and 10, these rib pairs are actually vertebral chondral, okay? Now, the last two pairs, 11 and 12. 11 is kind of hard to see, but it looks pretty much just like 12 right here. What you'll notice is that it still connects to the vertebra, just like all of them. However, notice it doesn't actually connect to any piece of cartilage, and it does not connect to the sternum. Therefore, these are just called vertebral ribs, okay? And sometimes you'll even hear them referred to as floating ribs, just because they do not connect on the other side to either the cartilage right here as the vertebral chondral ribs or the sternum as in the vertebral sternal ribs. So they're more or less floating. Now the correct scientific names that you would be required to write for all of these are vertebral sternal, which are one through seven, vertebral chondral eight through 10, and then vertebral 11 through 12. However, uh, what some people will use are some other names. For example, the vertebral ribs, because they float and are not connected to the sternum or cartilage, are called floating ribs. Collectively, the vertebral chondral ribs and the vertebral ribs, which basically means 8 through 12, are called false ribs. They're false because they do not connect directly to the sternum. Okay? Whereas the vertebral sternal ribs are also commonly called true ribs. They're true because they connect directly to the sternum. I know I'm being a little bit redundant and repetitive here, but hopefully this gets the point across. And another thing I did want to mention about this cartilage here that you can see uh, that each of the ribs 1 through 10 has is that it's also called costal cartilage. And it's a type of hyaline cartilage. Okay, so. Um, it's the weakest kind of cartilage, but that also allows it to be a little bit flexible because actually the ribs move up and down with inspiration and expiration, also known as breathing. Okay, so hyaline cartilage is the costal cartilage. And that brings us really through the end of the sternum and the rib cage. Now let's take a look at the basic anatomy of the vertebrae. And out of the vertebrae, there are really three sections. We have the top part of the superior ones, which are cervical. There are seven of these. We have the middle section called thoracic vertebra. There are 12 of those. And then five lumbar vertebra. And if you're ever looking to remember how many of each there are, there's seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar. Just think of the times that most people who have an 8 a.m. class eat meals. So they would eat breakfast at 7, lunch at noon or 12, and then dinner at 5. So that's the way I remember it. But let's take a look at the basic parts of each of the vertebra, because even though there's slight differences between the different sections, they all have the same basic parts for the most part. So this part right here, which is this normally rounded part and solid in the middle, is called the body, or sometimes called vertebral body. All the bodies of each vertebra are stacked on top of one another, and so as we go down the vertebral column, the body's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the cervical vertebra are gonna have the smallest bodies, if any at all, the top two actually do not. And then the lumbars are gonna have the largest bodies because they have to support all the weight of everything above it. Okay, so this is the body. You'll also notice about the body that it's the anterior part of the spine. That's something that's very confusing when you're just looking at this isolated. The body is anterior, and this part that actually sticks out in the back, called the spinous process, is posterior. Okay, So the spinous process points directly posterior. In fact, if you run your fingers down the middle of somebody's back and you feel those little bumps, if they have low enough body fat percentage, those bumps are the spinous processes of each successive vertebra. Okay, Pointing out laterally, are the transverse processes, okay? And the transverse processes are gonna take uh, different shapes um, in each of the classes of vertebra, but they're gonna be pointing out more or less laterally to some extent. And there's one on the right side, which is shown over here, and there's one on the left side. And again, I know this is left over here because the body has to be anterior. So this is the front of the body. So this would be left over here, and right, but there's always two transverse processes, okay? Now, this hole in the center right here is called the vertebral foramen. 
okay? And the vertebral foramen is something that every single vertebra has. And this is actually the space where the spinal cord will actually run down, okay? So this is the vertebral foramen. Now, if we look from the lateral side, this would actually be the left side that we're looking at of the same vertebra. We have some process that's sticking upwards and one that's sticking downwards, okay? And there's actually one on each side. The ones on this side, on the top, are going to be superior articular processes, okay? And there's actually going to be two. Um, actually, these right here are the superior articular processes, but they're not labeled. And of course, because this is the left side of the vertebra, this would be the left superior articular process, all right? And it'd be one on the right side that we cannot see here. On the bottom, we have the inferior articular process. And again, there's two of those. You can sort of see them here right in this picture. Um, there's one right here and then one right here. Now, when you're looking at most of these vertebra, again, the, the general shapes of these different features can change a little bit, but they're all going to be in pretty much the same locations, right? So it makes it a little bit easier to identify things. All right, so let's move on and look at the differences between these. First, we'll start with the cervical vertebra, of which there are seven. Now, the first two, which we'll talk about specifically in a minute, are a little bit different, but when you go downwards, they have the smallest bodies. Cervical vertebra have the smallest bodies. Okay? Also, notice that their spinous processes are bifid, meaning there's actually two things that stick out rather than one. If we look at the thoracic, there's only one simple spinous process, and it does not branch, and the same is true of the lumbar vertebra. But with the cervical, they branch, and so they're bifid, is what we say. Also, one way to identify cervical vertebrae is that they have these two holes right here. All of them have it. So if you see a vertebra that has two holes right here, that means that it's a cervical vertebra. Has to be. None of the others have those two holes. They all have a vertebral foramen, but only cervicals have these two holes. So cervicals have the two holes, and they have the two branches of the spinous process. One thing I will also mention is these two holes right here are called transverse foramen. And sometimes you'll hear them referred to as transverse foramina. That's what these are called right here. The others don't have that. Moving down to the thoracic vertebra, the body gets a little bit larger. These are intermediate in size. When you're looking at the spinous process of the thoracic vertebra, what you'll actually see is that they actually are oriented downwards more, especially as you get lower and lower. The spinous process is going to shoot downwards more, all right? Also, the transverse processes are more like 90 degrees to one another, more or less, okay? When you compare this to the lumbar vertebra, first of all, the bodies are very large, and the transverse processes are almost 180 degrees to one another. I'd estimate they're about 160, 170 degrees, but they're much more laterally pointing than the thoracic transverse processes, okay? Also, the lumbars are going to have much more prominent articular processes, both superior and inferior. Okay? They're much larger for the lumbar vertebra. All right, now let's consider stacking each of these vertebrae, one on top of the other, like we see here in the spine. The bodies lie on top of each other, but not directly. If you look in between each of the bodies, like in this segment right here, we see that there's a layer of fibrocartilage called the intervertebral disc. It just says vertebral disc right here, but really it's the intervertebral disc. And what this disc allows is some shock absorbance and extra protection because fibrocartilage is the strongest type of cartilage. And if we consider the vertebra, especially near the bottom, that have to support all this weight, that's the weight of each of the vertebra, but also the skull, the arms, the torso, all that stuff, they need a lot of protection. And so rather than having the bodies of the bones just rub up against one another, we put this layer of fibrocartilage here called the intervertebral disc. And it helps dissipate some of that stress, that physical stress on the body itself. And so when you hear somebody having a herniated disc, that means that this intervertebral disc is ruptured in some way or it moves a little bit such that um, you might actually have some of these bodies actually rubbing together, and it actually reduces range of motion and causes pain and all that stuff. All right, 
The last thing I want to point out is something you can only see when the vertebra are stacked. If you look at them isolated, you won't be able to see this. It's called the intervertebral foramen. And they didn't have this right here very visible, but if you actually look at these little holes right here, you only see these holes when the vertebra are stacked. So I kind of pointed the black dot right here. Hopefully you can see two of them. Those are called intervertebral foramen. And the purpose of those is that's where our spinal nerves exit. Okay, so spinal nerves that exit the spinal cord and they go and serve the various limbs and different things, they exit through those intervertebral foramen. And you'll notice that they may be really small, but every single vertebra pair has them. Okay, and so that's where those spinal nerves are going to exit. That pretty much does it for the vertebra. Now, there are two special cervical vertebra, and those are C1 and C2. When we talk about vertebra, we typically use the first letter of which type of vertebra it is. So cervical would be C, thoracic T, lumbar L, and then we can designate a number. C1 would be the most superior of the cervicals, and C2 would be the one just inferior to that. And these two actually have special names that kind of describe what their function is. C1 is called the atlas and C2 is called the axis. And if you're having trouble remembering which one is which, at least through the name, remember that atlas comes first in the alphabet because T comes before X, all right? So you can learn it that way. What you'll notice about the atlas is it has no body, okay? It does have these things which you're not required to know in this course called superior articular facets right here. There's one here and then one here. And literally the skull sits on the atlas. And specifically, it's the occipital condyles. So if we actually go back to one of the previous slides from a previous video, these occipital condyles right here that flank the foramen magnum, these occipital condyles which protrude downward actually sit right here in the superior articular facets, okay? And they form what's called the atlanto-occipital joint. And what this joint allows you to do is nod your head forward and back. Okay. So if you ever see those videos of people headbanging in like heavy metal concerts, they're actually just repeatedly bending their atlanto occipital joint. Now, the reason this bone gets the name Atlas is because there was a Greek god called Atlas. That's him right here depicted. And he carried the earth on his shoulders. And so because the, this bone, C1, called the Atlas, carries the skull, it's kind of analogous to Atlas carrying the Earth, since the Earth is sort of the same shape as the skull. And so that's why this gets the name Atlas. Supports the weight of the skull, but in addition, it allows you to nod your head forward and back, like saying yes. Okay? Now, C2 is called the axis. If we think of an axis, we might think of an axis of rotation. And so the axis sits right under the Atlas. And this thing right here called the odontoid process, also called the dens, actually sticks up right here um, through this hole in the atlas. And what this forms between the atlas and the axis, it forms the atlantoaxial joint. This joint, instead of allowing you to nod your head forward and back, this allows you to rotate your head like saying no. A good example of someone who has a really powerful, or we could say a mobile atlantoaxial joint, is an owl who can rotate his or her head three, almost 360 degrees. That would be a rotation on the atlantoaxial joint. But in any case, that's the axis. And really the only thing that you would need to know from this, other than being able to identify it as the axis, is knowing the odontoid process in the dens, which is this thing that literally sticks upward. The last two things which we're gonna cover very briefly are the sacrum and the coccyx. We're not gonna cover the pelvis here. That is technically part of the appendicular skeleton, the next week's material. The sacrum right here is actually five fused vertebrae. These vertebrae are typically labeled S1 through five, even though they're fused, but they don't actually fuse until around the ages of 18 to 30. There's some wide variation in them. And if you're listening to this video right now, Yours may not be fully fused at this point. But that's all you need to know is just the sacrum. And then the very tip of it down here at the bottom is the coccyx. The coccyx ranges in the number of vertebra that are fused together, but it's normally between two and four. Sometimes it can be upwards of five. 
uh, but the coccyx is also fused vertebrae and it is the remnants of the human tailbone. Humans obviously do not have a tail. Um, it's actually destroyed in utero. We do actually start out with sort of one, but it ends up dying and going away. And the remnants of that are the coccyx, okay? For this, all you need to be able to identify is just the sacrum and the coccyx if asked, all right? So hopefully this made sense to you and you learned a lot in this video about the sternum, the rib cage, and the vertebrae. That pretty much takes us through the end of this week's material and then the next week we're going to cover the second half of the skeleton which is pretty much the arms and the legs and that is the appendicular skeleton. Join us then. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.